But here's the the part that, that is really kind of scary. We know that FedNow, which is the the trial for the CBDC, is coming in, in July. Mm-hmm. If, capital I, capital F, if you were trying to get people to be comfortable with something that most of us who, who kind of know anything about centralized uh, systems like this, they're, they're kind of pure evil. So if you're getting someone, why would anyone want pure evil, right? If you've watched Augustine Karstens or whatever his name is, the guy from the BIS, talk okay. about, yes, of course the government should be in control of how you spend your money, when you spend your money. That's our job. No, okay. no, not your job. Not not ever your job. That That's a bad plan. So anyone who has any knowledge about decentralized systems or centralized systems would say CBDCs are pure evil, like surveillance tools and control tools, not a good thing. They're, they're, they're fiat, which is bad to begin with, on steroids, which is super bad. So think of the Terminator, right? So that, that's what this thing is. Why would anybody want that? Well, only if they've lost trust in the banking system. So if the Fed now says, well, you know, these other banks, they're, they're not safe. Look what happened to Silicon Valley. Look what happened to Signature. You know, look what happened to all these banks. They're all shutting down. Why don't you just put your money with us? Mm. It'll be safe. Put your money in the Fed. Put it in a CBDC. That is a dystopian nightmare that I really, I really am truly afraid of. Shortly after Silicon Valley Bank failed this month, the price of Bitcoin soared above $25,000, reaching a threshold the digital currency hadn't touched since June. This week, Bitcoin reached nearly $30,000, up 70% for the year. Bitcoin proponents seized on the price rise to argue that the banking crisis was prompting investors to convert traditional currencies into digital coins. One crypto executive hailed the bank failures as the end of the USD and the dawn of hyper-Bitcoinization. A company that markets Bitcoin to investors started putting references to the bank runs in its promotional materials. But despite the fanfare, there is little evidence that the recent banking collapse has generated widespread support for Bitcoin as a financial alternative. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, Mark Yusko updates us about the current banking crisis, and his outlook for Bitcoin adoption in 2023. You know, if you write the word crisis in Chinese, it's actually two characters, Wei Ji, and Wei means danger, Ji means opportunity. So yes, there, there's certainly a crisis, but but in every crisis, you have the, the danger part, and we can talk about what that is in terms of of the damage to the banking system and the collateral system, but there's also opportunity. And, and I think the opportunity here is is quite robust. And I think we're seeing it, particularly in, in Bitcoin, which despite a banking crisis and, and bank stocks collapsing as much as 100%, in some cases, Bitcoin went up 30%. So, so wait, what gives? In store of value, flight to safety, but let's let's talk about the banking crisis to to begin with. So so you got the first part, which is, all right, was was there a, a systemic or systematic clamp down on banks that were friendly to crypto? Choke point two point oh, it's been called. Yeah, I, I think it's actually pretty clear, right? I mean, that's not supposition or or hypothesis or pointing fingers at the big bad government. It looks pretty clear that there were certain banks that were targeted early on, Silvergate and Signature Bank to to start. Mm -hmm. But then something kind of strange happened in that Silicon Valley Bank, which really you wouldn't consider a crypto bank, it's more of a a tech bank, uh, a bank that was used by a lot of founders to to, uh, back their, their businesses, but also used by firms like ours, venture capital funds, Mm. to fund 
capital call lines of credit and you know very large bank very large business huge growth market and it got caught up in the second part of of the crisis which is this sudden realization now why it's a sudden realization i don't really understand that these banks had unrealized losses on their government bond portfolios mm -hmm. and it it all came to light you know on on the wednesday a couple of weeks ago 3 weeks ago when you know silvergate had basically been crushed uh and and put under and signature bank was was being crushed and then there were some noises about about some other uh related crypto related businesses but silicon valley bank basically had a little mini bank run some people withdrew some some capital so you know the way a bank works is they have assets which are our money right us as depositors put our money in it it's no longer ours it's theirs it's the banks and that becomes their asset then on the other side they have a liability meaning they have to pay us if we want our money back and then the difference between the asset value and the liabilities is the equity of the bank and so in a normal functioning market that equity value is positive and it accretes over time as they invest the assets either in make new loans or in in bonds and then they pay depositors a lower amount so if they pay depositors zero which we had for about 10 years and yep. you can buy government bonds at three percent awesome three percent risk-free you lever that up make lots of money as a bank banks are supposed to take those assets and lend them out to other people and charge higher interest rates and then even make a bigger net nim net interest margin make a long story short uh silicon valley bank had this this issue where some depositors took money out so like all right we need to sell some of our assets and and pay those depositors. Well, wait a second. Our assets went down in value because we bought government bonds. They mm -hmm. raised interest rates. And so we have these unrealized losses. Well, now we're being forced to realize those losses. And they said, all right, well, we'll just issue some new stock to, to cover it. And everything was kind of fine. They had, you know, two and a half billion of, of new equity issuance to cover the 1.8 billion and on a $200 billion asset, we're not talking a lot of pain, really a rounding error. And a couple people, and I won't point fingers, but everybody kind of knows who they are, sent these stupid ass, that's a technical term, memos to all of their, their underlying companies saying, get your money out. And they triggered a bank run. Yep. And, and bank runs are the one thing that can kill a bank. Absolutely. Right? I mean, fraud and, and bad management and all that can, can hurt a bank, but but what, what kills banks is a loss of confidence and a bank run. Because the way a bank works, we've all seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life, yep. is the money comes in, it doesn't get put in a vault and sit there. It gets lent out to other people and then they deposit their, their portion and then they lend it out again. And, and this fractional reserve banking system, I believe, creates wealth because you're putting money to work, increasing the velocity. But it requires confidence. It requires trust. It requires calm. Because if everybody comes in and says, I need my money, all of it right now, it, it just it goes away. So these idiots, in my mind, fomented this bank run. And the problem is in the old days, we've all seen the picture. If you go to Wikipedia and look up Knickerbocker Trust, you'll see the iconic picture of a bank run. You know, guys in their suits and hats and the women in their dresses, and they're all carrying their umbrellas and they're running toward Knickerbocker Trust, which famously was taking share away from J.P. Morgan. And mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan is quoted as saying, I like a little competition but they were getting a little too big so he spread a rumor that they didn't have any money and everybody ran to the bank tried to withdraw they had to shut knickerbocker trust down 
just coincidentally, J.P. Morgan was there to pick up the pieces for pennies on the dollar, right. and the rest is history, and J.P. Morgan dominates the banking system. So, has Bitcoin benefited from the banking crisis? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.